Randy Richard, Mount Hope, Lutheran Church in Casper, Wyoming. Uh, you exhorted us a few times to exercise some oversight in seeing how funds are being spent. Uh, can you give any practical pointers? What do you do or what you recommend specifically that we do? Ask questions. Ask questions of, of OIM. Um, they um, can't guarantee that they'll give you the kind of answers that you want to be persistent. Ask questions of the missionaries. Um, they need to be honest. Yeah, I'm trying to picture myself calling up OIM and simply asking, are you spending your money wisely? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to picture what sort of answer I'm going to get. Uh, uh, really, if it's that important, what steps can we practically take? I can't just call the Office of International Mission oh. and, and make you worry. Yeah, I think, I think the first of all, you need to know something. You, know, you, you need to have, if you have an idea that somehow the mission monies aren't being used properly. But I, uh, we need, I think, uh, I believe we need more uh, detailed information about what, the work that's being done. We, we were, we were um, required to do a monthly newsletter. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you receive a monthly newsletter from many missionaries? I don't currently, know. So some of you do. It's, it's usually a really wonderful picture of a baptism or, you know, a beautiful picture and, and a great story that goes along with it, you know. Right. And, and those things happen. It's, 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 it's sexy. It, it, it is. More it is. It is. <laughs> but there's more to it. And I think somehow, somehow we need to find out the more to it. You know, I was, I was really trying, I obviously expressed some of the trouble that I had, but I don't, uh, I never understood coming to an office and sitting five days a week. And that just made any sense. There was so much. And I was busy. I, I, had, I did have an assignment and I did preach every day, literally. Um, but there was so much that could be done there in Nairobi, you know, without, without going out into the countryside uh, right. or elsewhere. Uh, I'm not playing, trying to play devil's advocate too much. I agree with your point. I'm just trying to figure out practically how to go about it in a uh, productive way. I'll tell you another way. Uh, you could, uh, you could uh, volunteer your time at Matango or Makanyezu Seminary in uh, Addis Ababa and go see for yourself. Hmm. Because we need good teachers. And I heard, I heard your paper, so go teach for, for a short time. Uh, I have several questions. I'll try to be cogent because I know we're on a timeline here. Um, I've had many dealings with Gary T's, some good, some not so good. Right. Uh, heavily involved in the Haiti Lutheran Mission Society and um, been to Haiti six times, taught the seminary there, preached there many times. Uh, I was uh, chastised by Gary because we were supporting the Haiti Lutheran Mission Society directly and we're not channeling our funds through him. And because we were not channeling our funds through him, uh, in the eyes of the Missouri Synod, we were not participating in mission. And so uh, that was a uh, particular, really, really heartbreaking thing to uh, hear, see, and continue to witness. Uh, speaking of Haiti, uh, Doris Jean Louis, uh, was recruited to the Fort Wayne Seminary by Robert Croyce. He went to the Fort Wayne Seminary with the stated intent that he wanted to go back to Haiti and be the starter, originator, father of the Lutheran Church in Haiti. So he went to the Fort Wayne Seminary, he graduated with honors from the Fort Wayne Seminary, and then was told that he could do mission work in the United States. Uh, but if he went back to Haiti, that he would not be authorized for ordination. So he went back to Haiti. The Lutheran Church of France authorized his ordination. And the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod never officially recognized him uh, because of this political thing yep. that goes on. Yep. OK, one more part to the connection. Recently, I had a uh, wonderful visit with a uh, pastor who was at Higher Things. I went to seminary with him, name is just on the tip of my tongue. 
He's in the uh, Dominican Republic. Joel Fritchie. Joel Fritchie. Joel Fritchie, Dominican Republic. We support missionary pastor David Preuss, one of the pastors who was denied support through Gary Teese because he was too Lutheran. Uh, we support him directly in his mission work at the Dominican Republic. I asked Pastor Fritchie, I said, let me give you a hypothetical case. We have a member of our congregation who is uh, Hispanic. He might even be from Venezuela. And he would love to go to the seminary. But we don't want to do SMP. We don't want to do HIIT. How about if we raise the money and send him to the Dominican Republic, and he goes through the entire seminary process there and becomes a pastor uh, and ready to be ordained through the seminary in the Dominican Republic? And Pastor Fritchie said, well, I can't tell you how often I get that question. He says, I'm sorry to tell you that he would not be authorized for ordination and service in the United States. And I said, I don't understand. And he said, you'd have to bring that up with our two seminaries who have blocked anybody from graduating at the Lutheran Seminary, Missouri Synod Seminary of the Dominican Republic from getting ordained and serving in the United States unless they go through our seminary uh, programs here in the United States. So I guess with all that background, if I could just what in the heck is going on? Find out. That's, that's well, I don't know how. I don't know who to ask the questions of. I, you maybe know me enough by now, Pastor. I don't always ask the questions in the maybe the gentlest way. Um, Tell us what you're thinking. So, uh, you know, how in the world, you know, we are about preaching God's word and his truth and purity. The mission of the church is the forgiveness of sins. We are all united in this, and then we have these personality, political, turf war things that are going on, and I can't tell you how frustrating it is, and I can't imagine the frustration that you and your family have. And it was all political. So, ask questions, I, who, how? I, I guess what I would say, just in, in general, is all of you here, um, our synod, we, I, I think, you know, maybe this is an overgeneralization, but I think, I think there's a tendency on our part, you know, missions comes around, so we, so we contribute, we give money, and we say, good, now we're supporting missions. Rather than inquiring, rather than asking questions, you know, you've, you've got some legitimate questions there to be asked of OIM. You know, Daniel Miller is the head of OIM now. Uh, ask him. Um, I think, as a whole, we just need to we need to ask more questions. We need to know how this mission money is being used or misused. Um, there is a there's this ridiculous tension between Mission Central and OIM. And what I what I was trying to say in my paper with respect to Gary is that we should uh, I disagree with him in many many ways, uh, but. He, still is a brother, and I've tried to, I, in my dealing with him, I've tried to correct, and I've tried to uh, teach, you know, now, I, I think that's often been um, not effective at all, because he has his way, uh, but, but we still have to, you know, our missionaries, missionaries are very much dependent on what Mission Central does, we're almost held hostage by Mission Central. I hate it. Something needs to be done about it. And, and I think the only way we can do anything about something to, to help the situation is to speak up. Do you think it's ever possible that we could have a mission model where missionaries are not panhandling congregations I love that. and raising their own land? Do you think that's, that's pipe dream even possible? The only way it would be possible is if we could, if we could encourage and then consequently have every congregation contribute to missions, to Senate, so that they could be the they could be the funding um, base 
for missionaries. Now, I don't know how you do that. You know, I don't know how you do that. Now it's now it's simply up to to each individual. You know, we would we would go to congregations and the congregate. You know, I would do my presentation to congregations that are always supporting missionaries, and I and I would simply say, well, let me come and, and present. I just I love doing the presentation anyway because I did have a lot of stories and pictures. And I said, you know, maybe there's one person in the congregation who will who will be a supporter for us. Uh, but we're we're beholden, you know, missionaries. And and the thing is, um, you know. Missionaries are coming out of the field for up to six months at a time to, as I said, to gin up their base again, you know, to make sure they have enough money to go back. I just think it's an incredible waste. Um, yes, sir. My name is George Sylvester. I'm a member of Mission Cross Lutheran Church in Cross Lake, Minnesota, lay member. Um, I was a previously a member of St. John's Lutheran Church in Rosemont, Minnesota. Mm. And you say, be sure what's happening, dig into it, find out, etc. Gentleman came to our church in Rosemont and said, I think I was baptized and confirmed in this congregation, but I'm not sure. We never did find out, but our pastor became close with him and he passed, died, and when he did, he left about a half a million dollars or better to our congregation. So in order to say, hey, we've got to do something right with this, our congregation got approached and we went to mission work to build a school and church over there. We got pictures of what was happening, the buildings that were being built, and et cetera, et cetera. And it turned out that nothing happened, nothing was built, and one half a million dollars approximately went to nowhere. So as you say, look, dig, learn, know before you do anything because we don't know. And on Facebook, as we mentioned Facebook earlier, all of a sudden we get friend requests yes. from Africa or whatever. Yes. And no sooner, you think, yeah, I think I'd like to be a friend with this gentleman. Then comes, how about send us some money? Yes. yes. So no matter what you're going to do mission work-wise, be very, very careful of what, how, when, where, and why. Right. Exactly. And if you want to find the total end of that story, contact St. John's Evangelical. Evangelical Lutheran Church in Roseland, Minnesota. It's a terrible story. I, I'm sad to hear that. Yeah. We, I mentioned in the paper that we support um, Trinity, uh, the dual parish I had in Minnesota supported um, the Lutheran school in Manitoba. And one of the advantages I had was every trip I made there, we would go out in the bush and we'd see how our money uh, was being used. And I was satisfied. They were showing us how it was being used. Here's a picture. This is what we're doing. Here's the trucks doing the work. Here's what the building is doing. But it was a lie. lie. It was a lie. It was all lies. Yeah. Every day it was a lie. Yeah, I'm, that's sad. Uh, Terrible. Yeah, it is. Yes. Thank you for your presentation. My name is Pastor Paul Flo from South Sioux City. Um, and I found myself smiling a lot when we were presenting it because I went through the whole process as well. I did my pictures in the Dominican Republic mm -hmm. under Joel Christian. So, yeah, the whole process is very familiar to me. And I just wanted to, a couple of questions that Pastor Poppy mentioned. I think that the previous model was everybody sending a general missionary fund to the Senate. And I think part of the reason why they switched is because of a kind of an American uh, skepticism of the institution, you know. And so how do you change that? Well, I don't know. That goes pretty deep, you know. And, and so people want to hear the story directly from them. They want to know exactly where their money is going to go to this goes into a whole other thing of the year tagging their donations because they want to make sure it goes to what they approve of, which has good size and downsides. But so that just wanted to mention that. And then in terms of the questions of um, from a missionary's perspective like yours, um, who to talk to, I would encourage you all to talk to them. The, you can get on the, the, the LCMS website and find out exactly who's in the Dominican, for example, and contact them directly and say, what are the real struggles that you're going through down there? How can I support you? Tell me, instead of just going through the institution, uh, because it's going to be hard to find answers, maybe just go directly to the individual missionaries. Uh, that would be one thought that comes to my mind. I don't know if that's very helpful. Yeah. yeah, you can you can contact. Yeah, or if you find out that missionaries are coming to your congregation or in the same city to give a presentation, which they often are to raise funds, uh, meet up with them and then you'll say, okay, so in spite of all the good stuff that we saw, tell me what's really going on with some challenges, and they're hesitant to share that sometimes. Uh, because, like somebody said, it's not sexy. 
Uh, but at the same time, whenever you, as a missionary, when you have somebody actually asking you, tell me the real story so I can pray for you, really want to help, it's really refreshing. So that would be my thought. I agree. And when missionaries come to your congregation, um, you know, ask them, you know, what is your day-to-day -day work? I, I would have welcomed that question. I really would have. Because we, we have this idea, well, you know, we send those missionaries out, and they're working all the time, right? They're, they're, they're preaching the gospel all the time. They're baptizing all the time. And maybe they are. I'm not saying that they're not. But we should know that. We should all know that. And so it's legit to ask the question. And what are you doing today, day to day? Thank you, Jeff, for your uh, a reminder that the mission of the church is the forgiveness of sins, and Christ's work goes on overseas as well as it does through the great work of doing it. Uh, his work for you at uh, Red Cloud and Blue Hill. Um, can you uh, flash out just a little bit, help articulate? Um, I think I heard towards the end of your presentation an appeal for uh, some teaching at seminary. Um, does does that uh, what does that look like in terms? Of, can you just give a snapshot of a picture of what pastoral formation uh, looks like? Maybe it's different geographies to geography. Uh, I had the opportunity West Africa to go to Nigeria at a third. Day tour, and the thought was we were going to support um, pastors once they got out in the field because they were serving six congregations, and maybe the seminary education they received, uh, while it was as good as they could have done, it was limited. Is this in support? Is, uh, do you have in mind opportunities where the teaching is for? Uh, pastors who are yet to be ordained in go or in support of people uh, who are already at certain countries? So I'll answer uh, on the basis of what I know, and that's East Africa, and specifically the Tongo, the Nima Theological College, and it's both. Um, the, the men, in terms of the whole ministry, the men who come there, some of them are already pastors, but they, they need more depth, they need more learning, and, and so they Maybe they haven't had any exposure to Greek or Hebrew, and so they begin to get that. Um, the ones, uh, mo I would say most of them uh, come with a very little education. Uh, you know, so, I mean, you're starting with just reading, writing, and arithmetic almost, you know, and trying to build on that day by day by day. Uh, but they're eager. They, they really want to learn, uh, and they really want um, the kind of education that we have received our seminaries, uh, and we can help with that. Uh, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. I will be the end of the Q&A, and uh, we're going to have about a one-minute break in place. The best is going to be starting in just a moment.